and thank you all very much for joining us this afternoon or evening, depending on where you are, or morning. Um, so this is a talk about best practices, which is kind of a loaded term. Every time I hear anyone talk about best practices, I think of immediately of six titles or experiences that I've seen that completely break those rules. So the goal for this talk was not necessarily to put together what the hard and fast rules are to guide our creative and technical decision making, but it's more what are we doing right now to try and create a mix for content that's never going to be experienced exactly the same uh, way twice in a row? Is there even a right way to hear it? Um, you know, this is something that we discuss frequently and attempt to apply at least at a gut level, but are there ways for us to codify some of these rules formally? So that's the topic of uh, my talk today. Um, as uh, Sally mentioned, I'm Scott Salfon. I'm the audio experiences lead at Facebook Reality Labs. Uh, which was formerly known as uh, Oculus Research, so we're the research wing of uh, Facebook uh, related to augmented and virtual reality. Uh, we do investigations uh, and sort of invent our acoustic future, but uh, on top of that, I also try to keep a good pulse on the present and even sometimes the past that we might sometimes prefer to forget choices that we made in the past about how audio should be uh, implemented and experienced. My goal in this talk is to share some of what we as a community have learned, uh, relearned, invalidated, reaffirmed during uh, this fascinating journey of creating new experiences for new realities, which includes virtual, mixed, and augmented reality. I'll talk about all three of them uh, in turn. Um, I expect I'll say some things today that everyone uh, will not at, or at least you would not if you were in VR. I'll be able to tell how many people are in VR by how many of them not. Oh, I see some head shaking right there. Very good except you're actually in 2D. How are you doing that? That's amazing. Uh, that's right click, I, I guess. Um, right, right <laughs> click, drag up and that's down. That's right, right click up and down. Um, so yeah, some things that everyone will not at, but a lot of other things uh, that you may have found exceptions to in the past. So like I said before, um, you know, to quote a, uh, a not so recent Disney movie, uh, the best practices of uh, VR are more what you'd call guidelines than actual rules. So it's good to know the rules so you know how to consciously break them. So with that, let's go ahead and advance the slide. Uh, today's talk, I'm going to be breaking it into roughly three different parts. Uh, what we can learn, sometimes we, what we can't learn from other media, what we have to explore and discover ourselves, and then where we go from here. And hopefully, I'll have some time for, for Q&A towards, uh, towards the end. Um, so with that, let's start with existing media formats, uh, specifically linear media. Uh, let's start with radio, television, film, streaming, podcasts, and so on. Experiences that have a definitive beginning, middle, and end. Um, usually they have a defined length. Their interactivity from the audience is fairly low. You know, people can watch them, you can pause them, maybe you can fast forward or rewind, but that's, that's pretty much about it. And, you know, there's, there's a lot uh, about VR mixing that is very similar to traditional linear mixes uh, for film, television, radio, and so on. You know, there's, everyone knows we have the concept in, in VR of using knobs, of uh, being able to adjust sounds with sliders, busing, uh, and, you know, uh, make sure you don't clip. Uh, it's, everything's pretty much exactly the same. So thanks so much for coming to my talk. Hope you had a great one. If you had any questions, uh, you can follow up with me afterwards. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. There is actually, I mean, there's a lot that we can bring forward from the linear mixing process. Um, you know, at, focusing on delivering the most important element, the most prominently, all of the rules that we've learned from uh, Walter Murch's law of two and a half, from his dense clarity and clear density. There's all sorts of concepts um, that, we can, that, we can bring, uh, that we can bring forward. Um, gathering the best performances of assets and making sure that we're starting from high fidelity elements, even though we are going to then transform them and sort of have to make manipulations to them to make them feel like they're in our space. A lot of the things that we talked about this morning in the in the keynote with uh, with Valve, um, but uh, you know that's at the end of the day that part is you know rock solid exactly the same as traditional linear mixes. We're trying to figure out what is the most important and most relevant thing uh, versus everything else that we're that we're currently listening to. Um, with that, the arrow just oh no the arrow's there. There we go. Um, but that kind of brings me to interactive music, uh, interactive uh, sound, um, which has a lot more in common with our new realities. 
Um, you know, everything is going to be just in time. You have an experience or perspective that's often driving interest and priorities. And we see a lot of other concepts in developing our mixing best practices that are very similar. So with that, everyone here has probably seen some variant of this. Um, hopefully not this one in particular, because this is a really old GUI image. But, you know, VR mixing is in a lot of ways very much like game mixing. It's a just-in-time performance. We're using the same sorts of concepts of parameters, uh, randomization, et cetera. Um, this is an image of distance-based attenuation, which we spend an inordinate amount of time in virtual and augmented reality trying to get right, making sounds sound like they plausibly are the right distance to correlate with visually how far they, uh, they are from us. Um, because we're doing so much just-in-time performance, there's often uh, some necessity for submixing and content baking, pre-mixing, um, while keeping a bunch of different versions and some components available. So having a lot of variation, having a lot of, uh, you know, different versions of assets, um, the concept of level of detail, just-in-time prioritization as well. So being able to, you know, figure out strategies for mix management, whether that is culling. So saying, geez, I've got 60 different sounds right now and I'm trying to play 61st, maybe I need to get rid of one of the 50 that are playing right now in order to play that. Um, so just stopping sounds um, that are no longer of, of relevance or interest, but in obviously aesthetically appropriate ways. Attenuation as well, so being able to, to make sounds back off in the mix, whether it's because they're far away or whether it's just because they're less important to me. Once I've gotten that initial taste of a sound, if it's not important, sometimes a slow fade is actually a pretty effective way for us to help um, support the user changing their perspective. Um, other strategies for mix management that VR mixing shares with game mixing are things like um, uh, sound replacement. So as I get more and more instances of a sound, rather than having that fifth concurrent footstep, just replacing that with you know a recording of three or more footsteps, um, as as an example, or explosions, or sorry, puppies, puppies, uh, you know, greeting us happily, barking. That's always the example I try and use. Try to avoid the the violent examples when possible. Um, and lastly, this concept that I'll put in air quotes here of high dynamic range. Uh, so we're really trying to simulate a broad range of real world um, volume playback levels within a constrained dynamic range environment, whether that's a constraint of the device itself or whether it's just because, you know, practically and pragmatically, you don't, we don't really have the, the ability to capture and, um, and render back dynamic range at the, at the same level of fidelity. High dynamic range at this point is primarily a manual and creative endeavor. There are certain systems that are out there in, in tools that try and do some sort of intelligent, um, you know, automatic, uh, you know, side chain compression and things like that. But all of these concepts from game mixing really resonate for VR mixing. Um, you know, like I said before, everything's just in time. We're reprioritizing based on the context and the experience or behavior. That's something else I didn't even talk about, but the person is the camera. They are the director. They are kind of, you know, we can sort of hint to them as to where we would like for them to attend, but they're looking where they want to look and they're doing what they want to do. Um, and like I said before, everyone in VR knows and loves, or is that hate, uh, the dreaded attenuation curve that allows them to control how, how sounds behave with, uh, with proximity. Um, so that gives us uh, a lot that we can really carry forward from other media, but that's not what this talk is about. And that's why I'm going to try and move on 10 minutes into the talk into the interesting uh, parts of the talk, which are the ways that virtual mixed and augmented uh, reality mixing are different. Um, so I'm going to break the rest of this talk down into, I believe it's five sections. This, this slide used to build out and I could tell ahead of time, but uh, I had to stamp it out as uh, separate slides per instance here. So we're going to start with the rendering pipeline. So how we actually process and playback sound. Then I'm going to go into the mix process, which for anyone looking at the current state of uh, VR mixing um, from the outside, they would say, that's totally crazy. You're mixing without even being able to see your mixing board. That's nuts, but I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. The listening pipeline. So what is the actual endpoint, the last, um, you know, I, I just talked about how I'm getting fiber installed. Instead of the last 100 meters, uh, the last 100 centimeters. So how are we actually playing sound in a way that I can hear it? So now we're getting into the details of what kind of uh, speaker system or headphones uh, that I'm listening to the sound through. Next, the listener or listeners themselves, because sometimes in these experiences they are shared and sometimes they're shared locally. Um, but uh, 
having an active listener is is something else that, like I said before, is is kind of a bit different than than even interactive game mixing. And then last but not least, uh, mixing with the real world. Uh, whether we like it or not, people are listening to these sounds, not always in pristine environments. For example, having a jackhammer going outside um, that hopefully you guys haven't heard. Um, it actually went off once, but um, I was able to cup the microphone and hopefully it uh, didn't, uh, didn't bother you guys. Um, but uh, certainly for VR, but especially as we get into mixed and augmented reality, how do you make sounds that coherently complement the real world rather than just trying to replace it? So that's what this, uh, the remainder of this talk is going to be. So let's get into the rendering pipeline first. So one of the big differences um, uh, from virtual and, uh, I'm sorry, from, uh, from games and from linear media that came before it is the fact that most sounds are spatialized. Um, Yes, linear and film mixes have the notion of sound objects and positions uh, with Dolby Atmos and Windows Sonic and lots of other solutions, but they're generally at least supported by channel-based beds. Um, in VR, MR, AR, channel-based beds often don't exist, or, you know, I mean, there's certainly ongoing debates about whether it makes sense to, level, to, to leverage a channel-based mix, and there are techniques that blur these lines a bit. Um, for example, there's uh, a technique that's frequently used uh, in some Oculus titles uh, of a four-point compass system. So you have music that you position in quad around the listener. The music rotates with the experiencer while staying at a fixed distance. I have, I'm doing all these amazing hand gestures right now, and none of them are translating. It's making me very sad. Um, but these channels are still being spatialized. Um, Having content that is not spatialized in some manner, like headlock stereo music, is somewhat equivalent to wearing headphones while walking out in the city. It's You're having sounds that, that feel like they're attached to your head. It adds a layer of abstraction that can break the immersion of virtual reality. So again, there are certainly scenarios that break this rule. I'd encourage you to, to talk with me uh, after this lecture about uh, about your own best practices. But point source spatialization is is kind of one of the, the beginnings um, of, of uh, where a lot of sound implementation actually lives in the space of uh, virtual mixed and augmented reality. So you can see I've got a whole bunch of little green dots around me and I was even able to hide one a little bit behind me, but sort of showing that we kind of have uh, a bunch of sound sources that are, that are being rendered around us. So that's one of the differences in the rendering pipeline. There's another strategy for spatialization, which is, um, you know, to use uh, strategy, uh, to use technologies like ambisonics. Um, so to, to get more virtual sound scene spatialization or for people coming from games, sort of the audio equivalent of a skybox or having an immersive shell of sound. Um, strengths and weaknesses of uh, this technique, you know, ambisonic effectively uh, gives you some uh, pre-filtering uh, for first order ambisonic, some risk of smeared or loss of directionality, which can be completely fine for on the rails experiences. Um, and for some kinds of music bed experiences, I mean, strings sound amazing. Uh, or at least they, they can sound amazing in first order ambisonics in part because they kind of come from a general direction, but it's you're not generally getting it from a pristine point source. Um, but uh, ambisonics uh, provides you a lot of other techniques. Um, I'd refer you back to other AES conferences and some of the content that's actually being presented here uh, on strategies uh, related uh, to ambisonic uh, music. In fact, I think the next talk is going to be talking about uh, uh, spatial music uh, and is going to discuss um, ambisonics a little bit as well. Uh, still under recognized and underappreciated uh, is a really important way to add mass to our worlds with volumetric sound sources. So you can squint and you can kind of say that a roll-off curve gives you some sense of this or that a virtual sound source that moves relative to me uh, to cheat that river that I'm walking next to in VR is, is kind of a way to do this. Um, but this is like, this is an example right here. I've got a waterfall. If I'm going to be able to move around it, I don't want it to set, to have the sense that it's coming from a single, uh, single point source, uh, around me. So as an example of solution, uh, there's tons of solutions here, by the way, the Oculus spatializer is one of them. Uh, we support more sophisticated sound object shapes. Uh, such sounds can be a composite mix rather than just a single mono object, um, especially as objects need to have a deep level of detail to be fully plausible, this is a technique that really would bear um, more ex exploration. Um, 
And I was going to say one other aspect uh, related to volumetric spatialization would be um, emission patterns. So one of the things that you've probably noticed even here at this conference, super helpful to have everyone talking from a discrete point in space. However, that's not really the way that we talk in real life. Our emission pattern tends to be directly in front of our mouth and there's filtering if you move around behind someone, which is not happening, nothing against all space VR, uh, but is not happening in this current implementation. So I don't know about you guys, but um, I've spent a little bit of time in the lobby um, trying to uh, have a conversation with someone and hearing someone else who was behind me and facing the other direction. So I shouldn't have been able to hear them very well at all in the real world, but because alt space as sort of generic omnidirectional sound sources, I, I still hear them fully intact, which makes it a lot harder for me to, to have a conversation. I'm seeing some people laughing and or smiling, so everyone else has had this experience as well. Um, but again, getting beyond those perfect idealized point sources that emit omnidirectional is kind of a first order way to make um, sounds more immersive. And it's something that you really don't notice nearly as much in a 2D um, sort of uh, traditional setting. Yes, there's there's definitely a place for um, realistic sound emission, but certainly when you're in an immersive environment like virtual reality, it becomes uh, that much more relevant. Now, this is usually the point in the talk where somebody talks to me and says, I don't like spatializing. There are certain sounds that I've created that really just don't sound great. Um, spatialization wasn't plausible. It colored my sounds too much, and I actively decide that I'm going to bypass the spatializer in favor of headlock sounds. Um, there's definitely a valid point to be made here. Some sounds, especially synthetic sounds that are already kind of hard for us to sort of grok what they mean, as soon as you try and spatialize them, our minds still can't really say that, that, that it still doesn't sound like it's necessarily in space because it's, again, much more abstract. Um, or generic HRTFs, which we've had multiple talks about now, also don't always work at all positions for all people. So yes. Definitely a valid point. Some sounds, um, you know, played as if from a perfectly idealized point source emitter with a given spatializer HRTF just lose energy or character that we don't want them to. However, I'd recommend other strategies before pulling the lever entirely back to stereo playback. Because um, there's a lot of negatives that come um, with going back to stereo playback. Number one, stereo playback can make the sound louder than any other sound. Number two, stereo playback can mask the spatial cues of other sounds. So if you decide that this one sound is not going to be spatialized, oh, do I need to re-megaphone? Megaphone. Thank you very much, Megan. I'm going to re-megaphone. There we go. Did we reset? Can everyone hear me again now? OK, love, happiness. Thank you, guys. Again, keep, keep giving me happiness if you can hear me, sadness if you cannot, and I will uh, I will re-megaphone myself every time. Okay, good. Um, so what was I saying? So yes, uh, it can mask the spatial cues of other sounds. So taking one sound and removing it from uh, from your spatializer can knock out all of the frequency cues that are helping other sounds actually uh, plausibly feel externalized. And so taking one sound out of the spatializer can collapse the entire spatial um, sound field. Uh, it can also dominate spatialized sounds. So if you do decide to bypass um, make sure that you bring down the amplitude because a sound that's not spatialized a lot of times by, defa by default can play much louder because it's playing as if it's right inside your head. As alternatives to bypassing spatializers entirely, um, I encourage people to explore uh, virtual speakers, um, you know, at least at fixed distance and from aesthetically appropriate locations. So rather than having a, a 3D point source, you instead say, all right, fine for this particular ambience or effect. I will still make it stereo, but I will sort of push it externally into the background and get at least some amount of presence out of that. Or as another trick, um, there's plenty of publications that talk about where the primary spatial and spectral cue areas are. So you can sometimes hack a little bit there and take a sound if you are going to fully bypass, um, at least give other sounds uh, the chance to shine through in those primary areas. So try and knock down those, those spectral cues. All right, end of rant about spatializing, but I thought that that was, uh, an, uh, it's an interesting conversation topic that comes up very frequently. Uh, next up is the reverberate, uh, the rendering pipeline. Uh, so I, I, uh, I oh, sorry, but we're still in the rendering pipeline. Um, spatializing reverb is also uniquely important in VR, MR, and AR. So 
in games and in linear media, it's often been plausible in the past to just use a fixed convolution that I captured in this amazing space, or even a traditional delay line based reverb. That's a lot of times sufficient. I'm not there in the environment. I'm watching it on a screen. And so I'm not really going to notice if the sound isn't plausibly bouncing off of you know, the wall that I'm near, or in the case of this picture, uh, my amazing clip art cave um, that I've built. But in the, yeah, in the first person perspective uh, of immersive VR, MR, and AR, that just doesn't give enough cues as to where I am, either really or virtually. So knowing that a wall exists, and by the way, this is whether virtual or in the real world, um, in AR or in VR, uh, and I'm right up against it, uh, makes it, it's made much more plausible by the slapback of my voice and Foley and other environmental sounds actually interacting with it. So this is particularly significant in location-based entertainment where there may be a real physical object uh, that maps to the virtual object that I'm seeing in my HMD. And we want to sustain the fiction as much as possible without sacrificing safety. So it's great to be able to tell somebody they're near something they could crash into. And by the way, it's not just virtual. There's, there's something real backing it up. So this often leads to the question of, well, just how, how dry should sounds be captured when they're going to be spatialized? Ideally, if we had the most amazing ultra high fidelity reverbs in the world, yes, we would go for fully anechoic recordings that were completely dead and we would depend on our runtime reverb uh, to make them really sing and feel like they're plausibly in the environment. That requires a level of sophistication and CPU resourcing and GPU resourcing that frankly just isn't quite there today for most experiences. So a best practice that I've found, and again, this is in surveying lots of other games. This is not my own perspective, by the way. I've been, I survey and talk with a lot of people who have built uh, experiences for Oculus Rift and Quest, uh, for location-based experiences that have used our platforms and just surveying and talking with people across the industry. So if your perspectives differ, please come talk to me afterwards in the next version of this talk. We'll include your perspectives as well. But um, anyway, as a best practice, most of the people that I've talked to say, a small amount of gentle sound warming is still helpful. Um, that said, just remember that those baked in reverb cues are going to emanate from the perceptual position of the sound itself, not the environment. So try to be pretty conservative. Like if there's an echo that comes from where my voice is, that is gonna be a little bit of cognitive dissonance with reality. Um, so, I mean, a lot of this really sort of echoes the history of, uh, you know, interactive scene lighting um, from early days where lighting was just baked into the textures to now actually needing to remove all lighting and geometry detail in order to get the proper response and the proper simulation. So um, lots of lots of correlation there. Let's get into what I think is one of the more interesting parts of the talk, um, which is the actual mixing process. So I talked about this a little bit at the top, but one of the weirder challenges of the workflow to mixing in VR is that you can't see your mixing controls while you're mixing, while you're wearing the uh, head mounted display. Or if you take it off to mix, then you can't see the rendered visual objects. So especially in an experience where audio correlates to scale and believability is so significant and so important, um, I really wanted to uh, explore and enumerate the strategies that people are using to couple visuals with audio where possible, uh, just uh, or to work around it when, where we can't. So there's a lot of different strategies here. The logistics of your own project and your own past experience will dictate the one or ones that work best for you. But every time I've, I've shown this list to people, everyone's like, oh, I've never thought of that one. So um, I've, I've found that it's pretty useful. Um, let's start with the very first one, which is uh, co-pilot mixing. Um, so, and by the way, if people want to throw up hearts, if they've done any of these as I talk about them, please do. Uh, Copilot is uh, where we have uh, two people in the room. One person is wearing the device, uh, and they sort of uh, they view and listen to the mix in the HMD, and then they explain to another sound designer what they want changed. So, first steps, which is the initial out of box experience that you get on the Quest um, and the Rift S. Uh, use this technique pretty extensively, um, especially uh, as they were trying to figure out compression settings and some of the EQ. Um, next up, we've got, uh, uh, let's see what the next one is, uh, is the single player version of that, which is diarized mixing. So that's me and a cassette player because I'm working alone because maybe there's a pandemic or something. Um, and so I'm actually making a recording, probably not actually on a cassette deck, but I'm doing some sort of diarized mixing 
uh, and sort of noting where the mix is or isn't working for me. So the next time I take off the HMV, I'm able to batch up some of the processing that I want to do. I'm seeing some parts from the back of the room. So some people are, are using uh, this strategy. Uh, the challenge for me with this particular strategy is remembering what the heck I meant when I said something. Um, so even 15 minutes later, I'm like, I have no idea what I was talking about at that point. So make sure that you develop a language or some way to sort of annotate uh, your diarized mixing. That's kind of one of the big challenges there. Next up is um, externalized mixing. Um, so externalized mixing um, is where we step away from the HMD. We can only spend so many hours a day in that space. And so giving us some time in some real space to work in is super helpful, getting our ears away from the device a little bit. Um, so rather than wearing an HMD, we actually push it onto a nearby screen and then we push the audio away from our head and onto some farther field uh, speakers. Some people I've spoken to use a quad or a 5.1 setup. Other people have invested in some of the systems that support height channels like Dolby Atmos. Pros and cons to trying to fit this back, this sort of mix back into headphones once we get there. But you know the spatialization, the proximity are inevitably going to be different. But it's it's definitely a good starting point. Um, for Oculus Quest first party experiences, I talked about the, the quad music bed strategy that we use of taking music and putting it at, at the various compass point, the compass row around me. Um, this is often the technique that they use to, to create that initial quad mix, is they will play it back through in-room speakers until it sounds pretty good in the room, and then they will uh, sanity check how it sounds uh, on speakers. Oh no, somebody got sad. Um, Let's see, next up is audio only HMV mixing. Everyone is gonna, everyone should should uh, throw up the love icon here because I know you've done this, which is totally mixing blind. You've got the HMV on, you tipped it up on your forehead so you can't see the visuals at all. I'll admit it, we all occasionally do this so we can see enough to mix and still get some amount of real world tracking. Some people, yes, raising their hands as well, thank you. <laughs> um, some people who are really enterprising um, uh, that I've that I've uh, worked with have invalidated the warnings on their HMDs by actually cutting out the foam around the nose bridge so that they can actually um, peek down uh, beyond their nose and actually see their mixing controls um, without having to tilt up the the head at all. So that's that's kind of the cheating way to to, to do this. I'm not sure I, I, I would be quite ready to to do that to to my HMD. Um, another technique that I wanted to talk about that I think is pretty nice is hybrid HMD mixing. So this is something in between the technique that um, that I talked about before, uh, but that uh, Smurdy, Tom Smurden, uh, who, who uh, works on a lot of the first party uh, experiences for Oculus clued me into. Um, this is, you put the headset audio output through your, stu your studio speakers, and then you put the headset itself onto a mic stand and move it around as if you're looking around the room. So you're still monitoring, you yourself are still monitoring on a screen um, rather than in the HMD. Um, but it gives you sort of a sense of how I turn around and how I mix uh, some applause there, very good. Um, again, it's not a final mix. It does let you hear and adjust the balance between different sounds. Of course, you're adding crosstalk onto your spatializer. Um, so it's not gonna be completely accurate. It, um, you have to sort of trust and know that you're gonna have to go back into uh, the HMD, but it keeps your ears and your brain sane. So uh, again, this is another good strategy. Uh, another alternative for this would be if uh, you're enterprising and you have a pair of headphones with um, some sort of head tracking built into them um, that allow you to sort of uh, correlate and drive a visual display that you're still pushing to, to the screen as well. So. Um, so that's, a, that's another strategy. But sort of the Shangri-La is in situ mixing, which I want to take just a few minutes to talk about right now. Um, this is, you know, wouldn't it be amazing if we had uh, virtual mixing controls built right into the HMD so that I can mix on demand, you know, perhaps even dock the controls to world tied objects so I can control their distance based roll off as I hold it virtually closer, further away, um, you know, this is great, uh, a wonderful idea, but lest we, lest we think this is totally novel, here's one early attempt. I don't know if anyone else out there can identify it. Um, this is from Second Life. This is an example of someone trying to do uh, VR style mixing circa 2004, 2005. So for more than 15 years, we've been kind of experimenting. The controls on this one 
are not super amazing. I mean, one of the first things that we've learned is that taking real world controls and trying to bring them into VR is not necessarily the best way to move, whether it's sliders or knobs. It's just not super well um, attenuated to the VR experience. So with that, uh, here comes our, our great moment of truth. I'm going to try and play a video in just a minute of one of the experiments that we did. So, you know, there's a great analogy in the visual space of artists, uh, visual artists, trying to figure out how to actually create, sculpt, draw in virtual reality. And we were like, this is interesting. Why can't we try and take some of these same sorts of techniques and apply them to audio mixing as well? And again, we're not the only ones doing, uh, you know, doing this. There's, there's your VR. There's lots of other uh, amazing solutions out there. But what we did was we actually took um, the controls for Quill, which is uh, an Oculus drawing experience, but you could just as easily, you know, look at uh, Tilt Brush or some of the other drawing programs. And we said, what would it be like? if instead of drawing, these could be used to manipulate um, audio objects. So I'm gonna play you, hopefully, if this works, um, a video that shows how sounds could actually be manipulated in VR using, um, using virtual hand controls and hand gestures. Um, so you're gonna see a whole bunch of uh, sounds play and you're gonna hopefully keep hearing me talk uh, in a recording that I made to go along with this video. So let's, let's see if this works. If it doesn't work, everyone give me all the sad faces uh, in just a second, but hopefully it will just play. Is it actually playing or do, do I actually need to advance? I may need to advance one more slide. Oh, sad faces, it's not playing. All right, but that's okay, that's okay, because there's one more slide and then I think it actually starts. Hey, it's me from the past. Uh, so this is a video that we put together of uh, some prototypes we built using quill controls. Um, to try and experiment with audio mixing uh, using your hands. And so you're going to see a, a, a soundscape that's in front of me, and I can actually move and manipulate the entire soundscape. That little spaceman is going to be our perspective, although actually right now I have my own perspective, and you can see I'm able to pick up an individual sound object, make it closer or further away, uh, adjust its uh, attenuation curve, adjust its size and scale, um, and also by doing a different uh, hand gesture, I'm able to adjust the cone angle, so how the sound emission pattern uh, evolves. Um, I'm able to hold it close to me to be able to detect it, which is really uh, a nice way to be able to manipulate sound. And I'm seeing a sad face from one of the other rooms, uh, someone who is doing amazing, lots of happy faces, that's good, but I think there was exactly one sad face, so maybe that was one person, maybe not even the entire room. Um, Lawrence, do we have a way to try and debug for the one person? Otherwise, I can I can certainly talk through it and narrate it again. But um, um, what do you want to do? <laughs> I have a suggestion because it's a nice short video. Um, and since you let it play to the end, you could yes. simply retreat to the previous slide. Okay. And then, um, um, so now we're queued up to play the video again. Of course, the question is now what might we do so that it would actually work for, one of the, whoever, for whomever it didn't work, and I'm not so sure about that. Uh, Morgan, any ideas? We could reset that space, or I'm not sure how much of a problem this is. Um, I'm not um, getting response, so I, I'm not sure because um, I'm in one of the cloned rooms. Oh, yeah, go ahead and reset. Okay. Um, well, let me first ask, <laughs> it's so weird because we're these multiple instances. I don't know if, all right, let's try it. We're going to reset the rooms. Um, Morgan, if you got somebody in room, uh, I'm in 975. I'm going to reset this room and let's see, if, let's see if that helps. Give me a second. And then whoever, if there's somebody in the other two rooms, just go ahead and reset them. And then, Scott, you'll have to come back um, on air and amplify again. So give us a second. Oh, technology. I was hoping it would all just work perfectly. But like I said, for, for, for most of the people in the room, it did, uh, it did work well, which was, which was good to see. Um, while they're trying to diagnose um, and getting ready to play, I will just talk through um, what we displayed there. So this is a, like you are able to look at the actual sound stage. You're able to look at the sounds as they're positioned in 3D space. You're able to look at your wrist and use your wrist to have transport controls. So there's play and stop controls that are on your wrist. You're able to pick up an individual sound source 
um, and move it around and move it closer to you. And based on um, which combination of um, buttons you had toggled, you could adjust the cone, you could adjust the distance-based attenuation. And it's a really interesting and intuitive way to take sound sources um, and be able to mix them again without having to pull off your, um, your HMD. Um, Lawrence, should we give it a, another try to play it? Or should we yeah. give it another second to make sure everybody is back in sync with the slide deck and all that other fun stuff? Or Let's let's give it another try. Just give me one more second here. Um, okay, sure, I, no problem. Now I'm in the second cologne room. <laughs> and I, of course I can't tell um, because I'm sort of, I'm on air, so I'm ubiquitous. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, what the heck? I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to mute. Just just run it again, uh, everybody. Let's let's hope it works for you. And um, if you did, if it worked the first time, you can enjoy it even more the second. Yes, fingers crossed. Otherwise, I believe the YouTube version of it did grab it, so you you will be able to watch some version of it uh, later on. But let's go and action. More sad faces than happy faces this time. So the sad faces were again in a room that I'm not in right now, so I did not get to see them. But lots of love from this room. Thank you guys for the love. I appreciate that. Um, my recommendation is that we just go on from here. Um, yeah, that's a good idea. Lawrence, is that okay? And we can, if you want, we can try one more time at the very end if, if there's anything else creative that we want to try. But um, I just want to make yeah, sure we have time. People can watch it. People can watch it on the stream. Okay. People Great. Can watch it on the stream. Um, one thing that we didn't get to in that video um, is another of the many rules and best practices for mixing that we completely break. Um, we didn't show it in this video, but there was a little spaceman. Uh, I think you can still see the still image down at the, actually, no, right now you're seeing YouTube recommendations, aren't you? So let me move to the next slide, fine. Um, but uh, there was a little spaceman on that plane. And in general, the rule has always been you never detach the camera from the microphone in VR. In other words, my perspective should always be the same perspective as where sounds are. And this is one of the things that we actually decided was a rule we wanted to break. And so one of the controls that I didn't show you is you can actually tap that spaceman and that sets the microphone to be at their position. So now you're in an externalized view, being able to hear the sound at that space, uh, at that spaceman's perspective. Uh, sorry, space person. Why am I saying spaceman? Uh, um, so this is uh, this gives us the uh, you know the ability to sort of externalize and move the sound field without me having to be in it and sort of have this omniscient perspective over the top or underneath and still be able to hear how it sounds to someone sitting in the space. So that was something else that we found um, was really powerful that we um, that we built uh, that we put together. Um, that's a, that gets me to another of the challenges of um, mixing, um, which is moving while mixing. Um, you know, one of the biggest curveballs for mixing for personal immersive experiences is that, um, you know, there, uh, you don't stand still. Um, <laughs> there's things that are going to sound great at one fixed point in space and um, one given point in time, but most of our experiences do not have people staying in um, a fixed position. We've all seen the videos of people moving around um, and sometimes <laughs> crashing into uh, walls and things like that. Uh, for three degrees of freedom experiences, great. The above plus a super smooth swivel chair will do wonders for our mixing abilities. Um, but for full six degrees of freedom that we're getting uh, increasingly in our untethered experiences and in location-based entertainment, we really need to be able to get up and move. Um, and last, even the most amazing luxurious mixing stages um, I've seen are not really designed for that. You know, there's a sweet spot, maybe it's a couple of meters wide and it is not as big as any play space that I would ever want to use. So there's a number of basic guidelines and recommendations that we've seen people 
uh, mix and match when developing their experiences. Uh, the first one is teleportation. So this is a strategy for when I really just don't have space to move around in my mixing room. Um, assuming that the experience is actually implemented teleportation, yes, take advantage of it. Doesn't really help with space traversal mixing, so walking through the space. Um, I'm creating a discontinuity versus getting the natural blends of sounds over space as I walk, but for quickly jumping between several interesting uh, perspectives or sort of the hero or golden path snapshot perspectives, it's super valuable to be able to do that. Uh, replicating the actual environment. So that said, there's, there's nothing better than hearing the content where and how it's going to be heard, especially for location-based entertainment. How much can the experiencer move around? Um, are there other sounds or tactile cues that are going to come into play? We talked about um, the vibro tactics um, that a couple of location-based experiences have used. We talked about that a little bit this morning um, in the, uh, in the, in the BAL keynotes. Um, does the sound plausibly match or at least mask the real world environment? So a nice example of this was the design um, for Carne y Arena, which was a really powerful uh, VR experience that takes place while the experiencer freely walks around a large, real uh, sand-filled space. I think it's like 50 feet by 50 feet. And, um, you know, oh, and at some point, by the way, there's a virtual helicopter that's flying by that's simulated by giant subwoofers and high-powered fans and amazing stuff like that. Um, that kind of influenced uh, the mix quite a bit, obviously, and being able to replicate and iterate on it um, remotely was the best solution. And so they actually literally, uh, you know, reserved space in a hangar, and they actually did a lot of their mixing um, remotely in a in a hangar that sort of mocked up the uh, the configuration of of the actual space. Um, but being able to and people that I've uh, talked with who've done um, location based entertainment at amusement parks. Um, have said a lot of times it is until you get to the actual space that you're going to be uh, in, that's when you really get the sense of, you know, whether the audio is working or not. Um, the, in the, the in between down the middle strategy is downsizing. So when you just can't allocate an unused hanger for mixing, we don't always have those just hanging around. Um, but in this case, you find a playback space, usually one that's at least uh, 10 feet by 10 feet. So a decent sized room and it can be fully safely traversed to allow you to experience and tune the sound distance roll-offs, level of detail, mix validation, near and far from key sounds of interest. You still need to be able to teleport away for any greater distances, but you at least get a rough approximation by walking back and forth of how a larger play space would behave um, if the person had one. So it's kind of the, the, the medium uh, between teleportation and getting a, a giant space that I can interact with. Next, let's talk about the listening pipeline. Um, you know, it goes without saying that this is one of the biggest challenges of VR and mixed reality mixing. Um, it's definitely something that is uh, shared with linear and game mixing. Your pristine, amazing, incredible mix that you created on your super flat, you know, frequency response uh, cans or, or headset can end up in anything from the inbuilt speakers of the HMD to the uh, variable built-in speakers of a mobile phone, to the professional grade headphones, to cheap airplane earbuds. What the heck do you do with that? Um, if you're doing location-based entertainment, great. You might actually have full control over this. You get to choose what the hardware is that you're going to use. And there's a lot of uh, other implications uh, of that. But you, know, you might actually be able to say, no, we're going to always use this particular batch of this particular set of headphones. Um, and you can have some control over what the, um, what the actual listening environment is going to be. Um, but uh, for consumer experiences, the best solution today is often either lowest common denominator or multiple mixes. So on the plus side, many devices do allow you to detect whether or not the headphone jack is in use, and a lot of them actually do present a slightly different mix uh, based on whether it's headphones where they try to be as flat as possible versus inbuilt speakers where they obviously try and do uh, tuning to make sure that the sound mostly gets to you and, uh, and as flat as uh, possible from, from further away. By the way, you guys hearing the jackhammer now uh, in my speakers? They are going uh, outside, digging a hole right next to my wall. Amazing. Um, uh, so what was I saying? Uh, so yeah, uh, many devices do let you detect whether the headphone jack is being used. So then you can target headphones versus the built-in drivers potentially. Um, I do want to add that the listening pipeline can vary significantly from this. It's not just speakers a lot of times, especially for location-based entertainment. Um, in addition to, or sometimes in place of headphones, you might be using a combination of far field speakers. You might have floor rumble transducers, 
a jackhammer is being filtered out. I'm so glad to hear it. Uh, and a variety of other noisemakers, including other players, by the way. If you're in a location-based uh, experience, there may be other people who are uh, making noise at the same time, uh, too. Um, you might be able to roughly approximate this mix in the studio through similar combinations of speakers and headsets, but practically this means there's effectively yet another mixing stage to go through to validate your mix, uh, to validate your mix on once you get out of the studio and into the final listening environment. So this is what I talked about uh, as well before for LBE, is just getting into the actual space and hearing how it's going to actually be heard by people who are going to be experiencing it. Um, this... Oh my gosh, my entire floor is vibrating now from the jackhammer. It's totally fine. Uh, <laughs> this leads to one of the biggest curveballs for mixing for personal immersive experiences, which is that they're rarely going to be experienced in a pristine, low noise floor or anechoic environment. No home theaters, uh, sometimes not even in a noise controlled living room. They need to deal with the fact that people listening, people listen to them in the real world. Um, in virtual reality, we're generally aiming to replace the real world or at least the local world with virtual remote ones. So in a lot of ways, we're trying to suppress world sound. All right, great. Um, we can play our sounds over them. We can make sure that we have closed back headphones. Um, we, we're trying to uh, suppress world sound, but that does mean sometimes we'll have to reduce our dynamic range to always punch through the noise floor. That can sometimes mean players, uh, like I said, intentionally need to go to noise canceling headphones depending on their environment. In augmented reality, we actually have, and this is where my talk transitions a little bit more into AR, um, we have an additional challenge, which is our sounds are intended to mix with the sounds of the real world. We want them to be audible, but we want them to be comfortable, we want them to be plausible, we want them to feel like they belong there. Um, plausible, especially because audio and its cousin haptics are often the replacement for actual tactile feedback. And so in AR, the strategies for mixing can get much more fungible depending on where and how I expect to use the device. If I'm using it in a noisy environment, if this is something that is gonna be uh, AR for an aircraft carrier, I may squash the dynamic range significantly and pick a sound palette that cuts through the spectrum of naturally occurring sounds. I may intentionally go outside of the natural and the organic. Um, now, if my device uh, can actually understand aspects of my environment, the sound that I uh, experience um, can mean a variety of things, but as a few examples, uh, acoustic occlusion and obstruction for virtual objects that are behind real objects, um, the experience reacting to environmental levels, like we've seen in stealth-based console games, where I'm, I make a noise in the real world, the virtual world, enemies are alerted, and things like that. So what's the main takeaway for AR mixing? Um, as far as handling real-world ambience, you know, likely we still author and mix in a critical listening environment. For a lot of the uh, Spark AR experiences, we actually try and incorporate real-world use cases into how we mix. So how does it sound when it's held in front of me? How does it sound um, you know, to, to hear sounds when I'm actually in a noisy environment? So a lot of times we'll actually mix against uh, uh, recorded voices. We'll have a background of conference room style chatter and we'll actually mix over that just to make sure that the, that the sound actually gets through it. Um, I am running low on time. So I wanna go ahead and march ahead to listener expectations which is the biggest challenge. Um, people have heard sounds at movie theaters, from TVs and radios, even from their phones for, for many years at this point, uh, more than a century for film. Um, how do we set or meet the expectations for sound that's being perceptually simulated? Uh, the, on the plus side, the expectations are really undefined right now. Physical versus digital world relationships are really nebulous. Um, we're still figuring out in a lot of different ways what the uncanny valley is across multiple axes of quote unquote fidelity, interactivity, detail, and so on. We're getting an ever more active first person perspective. What should we be mixing relative to? Um, the first person is actually an active participant. So how should we mix our playback if we expect them to be engaging in the acoustic environment? So if they're gonna be talking to others in the room or to an assistant, we wanna make sure there's enough acoustic room so that they can actually talk without having to feel like they're yelling over our audio experiences. We wanna be able to get out of the way. And that's one of the other things that, uh, that Spark has spent a, a lot of time uh, tuning for um, our phone and for our portal-based uh, experiences. Um, and level of detail, significantly more than, than um, games and traditional media, because people literally stick their heads next to or into a sound volume. What the heck do you do then? Um, Carne y Arena actually had a really interesting strategy for this because uh, it was real people that you could actually see. And if you stuck your head into them or if you positioned yourself so they walked through you, um, you could actually uh, sort of 
you had this experience of seeing inside of them and it was like a simulation of their heart beating and so you could see how stressed out they were which very powerful very unique very different um, but sort of an amazing kind of uh, way to have uh, again audio as uh, this immersive um, component that sort of you know added to the emotional resonance of the experience um, for Oculus, we developed a toy box, uh, which was a, a bunch of sound objects that you could pick up and sort of shake or rattle or play with in the in the near field. That was how we sort of demonstrated our initial near field HRTF simulation. Um, and we realized that just a basic sound with random pitch and volume is definitely not enough to sell the experience. It came off as false. So we have a lot of significant uh, level of detail and randomization. We have a physics engine integration that lets us model hits, slides, rolls, um, a large matrix of practical recordings. So I'm going to close with the best practices so far, which I think we've probably, I've already kind of said, but I want to sort of wrap up pretty quickly. Um, from other media, we have plenty of best practices that we can bring forward. So critical listening and mixing in a high quality environment, still important. Then taking that into the environment that that's going to be listened to, also important. That part's a little bit different. So listening and validating on people's actual devices in the actual environment um, is is something like it's it's the same thing where uh, a film mixer will take their film into an actual theater a lot of times to to do final notes uh, on their on their mix pass. Uh, and then everything that we've learned about storytelling that is obviously completely still valid for virtual mixed and augmented reality. Um, no talk about best practices would be complete without some reference to playback levels and having well-defined ones. Luffs is a standard that's being used in film and games, so it's useful to capture it here. It's kind of interesting because VR devices in particular um, and AR devices a lot of times have a volume control knob right on them, so Luffs loses a little bit of meaning if I can crank up the volume, but Assuming that people use the boot sound or uh, built-in shell noises as a way to set a fairly comfortable listening level, this is the guidance that we've uh, basically shared with all of our games um, uh, for the Oculus Rift and for the Quest of setting a level of minus 18 luffs. We expose that as a super easy to access meter in the Oculus Spatializer. Portal, the same thing for media. Playback during calls is kind of interesting. I talked about this before, but you don't want people to have to shout, and so we actually knock it down another 6 dB. And then for Spark experiences, we try to go a little bit more casual in part because we don't really have control over the phones and we don't want to try and get into trying to solve for all the echo cancellation challenges and things like that. Um, and so for Spark AR, if you're doing any playback during mic capture, we go really quiet. Um, definitely minus 35 at least. And for a lot of our sounds um, that we're trying to capture, we'll knock it all the way down to minus 55. So uh, summary. Plan for the real world's potential impact. Um, so VR, expect people are going to be listening to your experiences even with a jackhammer going right outside their window. Uh, for AR, compliment and just be accepting of the fact that your sound is meant to integrate with the real world and you can't suppress it and, and you, you wouldn't want to. Um, make sure that you're thinking about mixing in space as well, which I didn't spend much time uh, talking about here, but the fact that you have 360 degrees, uh, a full sphere around you, not just uh, within the azimuth. Um, be thinking about what sounds make sense to pull above me, you know, maybe sounds that are further away or more heads up display or notification type sounds, bringing them out of the environment a little bit by making them in a, in a sort of more natural space for me to sort of be able to glance up, uh, so to speak, with, uh, with my ears. Uh, and so using elevation as a tool. And again, not just for literal sound localization. Sometimes um, pulling sounds out of the environment helps me distinguish um, the artificial from the real. Thanks so much for coming to my talk. I'm sorry I am two minutes over, so I don't know if we have time for Q&A, but uh, this is a couple of pointers uh, to other resources. At OC6, we had a great talk from uh, Smurdy that went into more detail on spatialized music. Um, the Oculus documentation has mixing scenes for VR, and as, as you saw from this talk, I'm still trying to work on the, the Bible for AR. Thank you all so much for the applause uh, icons. Lawrence, do we have time for any questions, or is the next talk immediate, immediate? It's immediate. Why don't we do this? Um, I don't know who has the um, uh, stamina for it, but we do have our uh, four o'clock open chat in the Ever Lobby. And maybe if I don't know if you will be there, Scott, because the jackhammer might have gotten you by then. Um, <laughs> uh, it, we last yesterday, a lot of people did convene in the lobby and chatted for a while after. So maybe if people had questions for you, they could ask them there. But I think we better reset the space and get ready for our um, next talk, which is in two and a half minutes.
All right, awesome. Thank you all again so much for coming. That's my email. Um, you can send me an email if you have any follow-up questions or want to chat more. I, like I said, I'm always loving to learn more from people as to the best practices that they've been developing. Otherwise, hopefully I'll see you all in the lobby at four and uh, enjoy the rest of AVAR. Thanks so much again for coming.